This government will not apologise for it. We will not apologise to ensure the right people get the right amount of money at the right time. We have a lawful obligation to do that, and we will continue to do that sensitively, compassionately and appropriately. What a bunch of nonsense. Nothing about the coalition's robo-debt program was sensitive, compassionate or appropriate. When I talk about robo-debt, I'm referring to the Income Compliance Program, run by Centrelink from 2016 onwards. This series is a deep dive, and in part one, I went through how the program came about and how it was using flawed assumptions to create fake welfare debts. In this episode, I want to go into the human impact, which has been devastating, as well as look into the investigations by the Commonwealth Ombudsman and the Senate. Robo-debt impacted hundreds of thousands of Australians. A flawed and unlawful calculation method was used to assert debts that in some cases did not exist against people who had done nothing wrong. If you listen to the coalition ministers responsible for this disgrace, they'd have you believe that all the hype is overblown. According to them, robo-debt introduced an easy process, and if you weren't a welfare cheat, you simply had to do what Centrelink told you and you'd be fine. Well, Christian Porter is the Minister for Social Services. So we expect everyone who receives the letter to come back with the required information. And that's as simple as going online. From what we've seen, in a high-volume system, it's actually working incredibly well. What we, what we do do is send out an initial letter which says that we think that there is an issue that's arisen here. Now, if, if the issue is around the fact that there's been an annualisation of money that was earned in a short period of time, go online and you explain that. That's it. Um, I'm not aware of individuals who are completely convinced that they don't owe money but have been given a debt notice because, as I said... So you haven't read read any of this press? You haven't read any of the the media reporting of of people uh, expressing these experiences? I, I have read all the media reporting of this, but as I said, people are given the opportunity to update their records when a discrepancy is found to be present. Thankfully, even though the coalition was trying to cover things up, others were stepping up. The avalanche of complaints and people needing help put a strain on community legal centres and other advocates assisting people who couldn't afford to get lawyers involved. As these services were being overwhelmed, other volunteers emerged. Not My Debt is a website that was created in 2016 in response to RoboDebt. It allowed people to share their stories and provide resources and referrals. In many cases, volunteers have been directly helping frantic victims who have nowhere else to turn. Some members of parliament, like independent Andrew Wilkie, also took action. He had received numerous complaints from his constituents and Centrelink staff whistleblowers. Um, We know for a fact that a great many people are simply unable to find the historic paperwork that is often required to clear up the matter. Many people are scared when they get these letters. It is a scary thing to get an official-looking letter from the government. No wonder some some people are just scared uh, scared deeply and they're just paying the bill. They assume the government knows better. They assume the government is right. From the beginning, he had been warning the coalition government about the impacts of robo-debt. But when it became clear nothing was being done, he wrote to the Commonwealth Ombudsman to ask them to investigate. The Commonwealth Ombudsman looks into complaints about a number of federal agencies, including Centrelink. In this case, the Ombudsman decided to launch an investigation and released this report in April 2017. Now, while it covered some good background on what the RoboDebt program was and outlined some of the complaints it had received, its recommendations were very much focused on specific parts of the process, like the wording of letters or the ease of use of online systems. What the Ombudsman didn't do is consider whether the program was using lawful assumptions to begin with. This is despite the report looking into cases where non-existent debts were being chased. The Ombudsman said, this report does not comment on the policy rationale behind robo-debt. Later in the report, they said, in our view, it is entirely reasonable and appropriate for Centrelink to ask customers to explain discrepancies following its data matching activities. This one sentence in a report running over 100 pages that otherwise highlights failings in the program would later be used by the coalition again and again as a get out of jail free card, as if it somehow cleared their name. Here's an example. To attenuate this whole debate, you could just read what the Commonwealth Ombudsman has decided when he looked into this matter. And the Ombudsman has quite simply said it's essentially, sorry, it's entirely reasonable and appropriate for the department 
to ask customers to explain discrepancies. And the Ombudsman has said the system of calculation comprehensively and accurately captures the legislative and policy requirements. We can all go home because that's the verdict. That's the scandal-ridden Andrew Lamming. He's the same guy that was found to have misused taxpayer funds traveling around with his family only months before that speech. An independent review ordered him to pay back over $10,000. When asked about the debt, he said, I'm not paying back a cent of it and you can quote me. The hypocrisy is on another level. Anyway, back to the Commonwealth Ombudsman. The investigation was summarized well by Terry Carney, a law professor and former Administrative Appeals Tribunal member. He said, the Ombudsman's report appeared to have taken a presumption of legality approach without seeking details of the reasoning, much less scrutinizing any legal opinion. This, in his opinion, was an unforgivable agency lapse. The Commonwealth Ombudsman would do two further investigations in 2019 and 2021, but they were even more limited in scope and were mainly checks to see if their original recommendations had been implemented. As the complaints kept flooding in, Labor was also calling for the coalition to suspend RoboDebt until it could be fixed. It has been 40 days since I first wrote to the Minister for Human Services, alerting him to increasing public concern about the RoboDebt system and asking him to suspend the program until it could be fixed. When the Minister finally did respond to my letter, he continued to claim that there was nothing wrong with the system, despite the concerns everyone in this chamber will have received from their constituents, including those on that side of the House. That was Linda Burney, who, along with Bill Shorten, has been very vocal about the failings of RoboDebt. The Coalition's response was to hit back at Labor in the media. So what's, what's Linda Burney and Labor saying? That because we have a tiny level of complaints, so 270 odd out of 169,000 um, initial letters, we should stop a process which has already raised $300 million in taxpayers' money that should never have been paid in the first place. And over the course of the next four years, is going to recoup $4 billion worth of taxpayers' money. I mean, is Linda Burney serious? I mean... But the question is not whether or, whether or not this system is working. It absolutely is working. Labor and the Greens began calling for a Senate inquiry to look into RoboDebt, and one was set up in 2017 and then again in 2019. A Senate inquiry is basically a bunch of senators from the various parties that investigate an issue, calling for public submissions, holding public hearings, and then issuing a report with their findings. These inquiries highlighted some of the issues people were facing and the harm that was being inflicted by RoboDebt. The inquiries found that many people repaying robo-debts experienced financial hardship, pushing them further into poverty and making it difficult to meet basic living expenses. For some, the shock of a sudden and unexpected debt had a ruinous impact on their mental health. People reported their lives being ruined as a result of robo-debt. People experienced anxiety, depression, stress which caused physical illness, and fear. And that's not surprising. Many people had debt collectors chasing them down and pressuring them to make on-the-spot payments. For thousands, contact by debt collectors was the first time they had even heard about their apparent debt. Debt collection letters would demand immediate payment and threaten to withhold wages, take money out of their bank accounts and take further legal action. Just imagine how stressful it would be to receive a debt letter from the government demanding thousands of dollars if you are barely making ends meet. All this extra stress undoubtedly meant that people's well-being was put at risk. The Senate obtained information from Centrelink that revealed some startling figures. In the period between July 2016 and October 2018, there were 2,030 reported deaths of people after they had received a robo-debt notice. Now this data doesn't give us causation, and it's a complex area, but the stats are worrying. 663 of those deaths were among people Centrelink specifically identified as vulnerable. 102 deaths were between the age of 16 and 25, and almost 800 were under the age of 45. Then you had specific cases given as evidence to members of parliament, support agencies, and the Senate inquiries. The 2019 Senate inquiry noted that several individuals described thoughts of self-harm and suicidal ideation as a very real consequence of being in these circumstances. One mother, Jennifer Miller, wrote a letter to the Senate inquiry outlining her strong belief that her son's suicide was linked to the government chasing down unlawfully raised debts of over $27,000.
her son Reese, died in 2017. And then you had a leak from Lifeline showing that they had created a new category specifically for callers distressed about robo-debt. So what was the official response to all of that? Catherine Campbell was the head of the Departments of Human Services and Social Services at various times between 2011 and 2021. Died over robo debt, and you uh, don't even Senator, acknowledge the Chair, word. I do not Senator accept O'Neill, those assertions please. that are being made. They are not correct. This Your is staff this is it. difficult. It's alleged that the staff. These are staff. This was a letter from the union. We accept that. We've talked about that. But I do not think you it's appropriate it. that. Let no, me. I do not accept people have died over robo debt. You do not. I do not. Well, accept I'm that. sure the families of those who died and committed suicide will be very, very unhappy Set with your chair, answer today. We know that suicide is a very difficult uh, subject. We know mental health issues are very difficult. We do not accept that. In 2021. Scott Morrison promoted her to become the head of another federal department. Then we have Stuart Robert, the minister who was in charge of robo-debt at various times. Suicide is a very difficult topic and we need to handle it sensitively. Uh, so we, we reject the premise that uh, the, the connectivity between suicide and robo-debt, because it is complex uh, in terms of how we deal with those matters. Going through example after example of people's robo-debt experience, you start to see just how stressful it could get. Some examples were outlined in submissions to the Senate inquiry, including the Not My Debt submission. It showed that those unable to prove that their debts were fake were hit with repayment plans that reduced their weekly income significantly. One victim explained that Centlink was asking her for payslips from five years ago, but she couldn't get them because the company no longer existed. The debt left her and her daughter homeless, having to resort to couch surfing and living in a car. Another victim, said she was being left with $105 a week to live off after rent was paid, barely leaving anything for food. But even when people did prove their debts were fake, they were still heavily impacted by the experience. One victim was issued a debt for $2,000 for a discrepancy from almost seven years before. After days of calling Centrelink and requesting a reassessment, the debt was completely cancelled. But the damage was done. The debt caused her to have a nervous breakdown and she considered it one of the worst experiences in her life, forcing her off work and onto medication. She said, I live in fear of it happening again. The problem is that everything about RoboDebt seems to have been designed to be difficult and stacked against the welfare recipient. Remember, this is the Australian government telling people, you owe us money. There's a massive power imbalance there. The Senate inquiry found that when confronted with a large entity like Centrelink, Many people feel that they simply must comply with requests and have a limited capacity to advocate for themselves. This meant that many people just accepted debt figures because they thought the government wouldn't get it wrong. The way the program was publicised also didn't help. We know that thousands of people have been worried sick about receiving these kinds of notices. Um, we also know that because of the communications from the responsible minister um, in the lead up to the, this uh, program being unleashed, that there has been a perception created that if you do not comply, you may go to jail. This has been completely unacceptable in terms of the tone associated with this exercise. She's right. This was the minister when the program was rolled out. We will find you, we will track you down, and you will have to repay those debts, and you may end up in prison. And people took that threat seriously. One advocacy group gave an example of a client who was extremely distressed and thought they were being accused of cheating. The young woman suffered from anxiety and was crying and repeatedly saying that she was not a cheat. They said she was frightened that the debt, which was $17,000, would result in her going to jail. Many people just gave up and paid the debt, even though they didn't believe it was real. One victim said they felt so dehumanised that they paid the full amount to get it over and done with. This was another example. We've had a client uh, who uh, lives in Wyala who received a Centrelink letter saying that he owed $1,600. He was unhappy. He saw our financial counsellor based in Wyala uh, and he expressed that he was unhappy about receiving this. He didn't believe or understand how he could have arrived at having that kind of debt, but he felt resigned to paying it. Exactly. It's really common to hear that people just pay these debts even though they don't believe they owe any money. 
In that case I just played, luckily the financial counsellor helped the man dispute the debt, and when it was reassessed, not only did he not owe Centrelink a cent, he was the one owed money. Even when people tried to engage with Centrelink and figure out what the apparent debt related to, it was difficult. Those that have a lower level of literacy often didn't understand what the letters they were being sent related to, let alone what they were being asked to do. Evidence given by the Law Society of South Australia said that it is to be expected that some will interpret the initial notice as actually being a notice of demand. And when further information was provided to explain how Centrelink had determined the debt, it was often too complicated, even for the professionals. In one case, involving someone with the reading age of a five-year-old, Centrelink sent them a printout of payments dating back to 2001. The information had no explanation and was so complicated that even the lawyer assisting him did not understand what was happening. The other big problem was that Centrelink was asking people to obtain payslips themselves, when for some that simply wasn't an option. Many receiving welfare were unemployed because they had been made redundant from companies that had gone out of business. And even if it was possible, it was often time consuming and stressful, with one witness saying they spent over 100 hours obtaining historical payslips from different employers and working through the RoboDebt system. What makes all of this even more ridiculous is that for a long time, Centrelink itself was telling welfare recipients that they only needed to keep six months worth of payslips. In 2017, as complaints flooded in, they quietly removed that reference. Now through these inquiries, it's also become clear that welfare recipients weren't the only ones impacted by RoboDebt. Understaffed Centrelink workers were also affected. And while some whistleblowers have come out, Centrelink has been closely monitoring their staff's communications. The Community and Public Sector Union, which represents Centrelink staff, told the inquiry that staff members were monitored in the event they even contacted the union. Some of your own members are reluctant or even refusing to speak with you for fear of um, action under the department's code of conduct for employees. Did I understand that right? That the code of conduct is a bit like a sword hanging over the head of your members? Yes, we've been told uh, in, some, in one case particularly that I'm um, thinking of, I had a member tell me that they are watching my emails. Uh, they they are, as in the department? They are, yes. Uh, and that, um, uh, you know, Facebook communication is also being uh, uh, watched. They track their who work sends emails, emails from Not their work content. email to CPSU. Yes. Oh, they read the content. Yes. So okay. if the, employees the are sending you an email, that yes. email is being tracked by the department and read? Absolutely. And when you move past the direct human impact, RoboDebt was bad policy in a lot of other ways. The whole point of RoboDebt was to ensure the integrity of the social security system. But in reality, what happened was the complete opposite. The community's trust in social security has plummeted. As one witness submitted to the Senate inquiry, these widespread perceptions of unfairness of Centrelink processes become entrenched, and this presents a risk that compliance with Centrelink obligations will be reduced. In other words, the general public starts assuming that Centrelink can't get it right and that no debts are real. Clients have lost confidence that any debt letter they get is correct. We spend countless hours with many calls explaining what a robo-debt is and why, for example, if the person's got a family tax benefit reconciliation debt, that's not a robo-debt but it's just a waste of our resources, it's a waste of the client's time because they can't get an explanation of what in fact the debt is that they have. RoboDebt also caused an increased demand for services like legal aid, welfare rights, financial counselling and other social service organisations. This meant either people couldn't get the help they needed or there was less resources to help others with unrelated issues. I've gone through a whole bunch of impacts and it's by no means an exhaustive list but I think it's clear that on so many levels, RoboDebt was a failed program. For all this damage and destruction, the taxpayer paid at least $600 million to run the program. That's like if 31,000 taxpayers worked for the entire year and then all their taxes went to running RoboDebt. What a waste of money. The 2017 Senate Inquiry Committee made 21 recommendations, including that the RoboDebt program be put on hold until the issues are addressed, and that everyone with a debt unlawfully calculated 
have their debts reassessed. But I should clarify something. When I said the committee had made these recommendations, what I meant to say was that the non-coalition committee members had made these recommendations. You see, the members on the 2017 Senate inquiry were a mix of senators from the Labour, Greens and Liberal parties. The Liberals were the only ones that didn't agree with the findings. Instead, they wrote the coalition senators dissenting report. And the eight pages they wrote out of a 155 page report was a complete joke. The dissenting report didn't once properly acknowledge RoboDebt's devastating impact to people across Australia. Instead, it said that coalition senators recognise that ensuring the integrity of the welfare system is a key focus for the Australian government. It then went on for pages about the Commonwealth Ombudsman investigation I was talking about earlier. It even had the get out of jail free sentence, saying that the Ombudsman had endorsed the government's approach. The dissenting report also contained the lies that RoboDebt hadn't reversed the burden of proof and that the process hadn't changed. Ultimately, they said, the coalition senators reject the central conclusion that RoboDebt lacked procedural fairness. At the end, they also had a dig at any organisation that dared advocate for and assist those vulnerable people in the community that the coalition was going after. Coalition senators further note the input from some third parties, such as Not My Debt, were aimed solely at scoring political points and inflaming the situation rather than offering practical assistance in resolving the issues raised. Good on these two, attacking organisations that are highlighting examples they so desperately are trying to cover up. Normally after a Senate inquiry report is released, the government is given the opportunity to officially respond. The coalition did just that, but you can probably guess where this is going. In their response, they said, the government has carefully considered the findings and recommendations of the Senate committee, but agrees with the conclusions in the dissenting report. In particular, the government agrees that input from some third parties was aimed solely at scoring political points. The government notes that a significant proportion of statements relied on as evidence are not accurate. The government basically said that victims didn't know what they were talking about and that this was all a political stunt. And RoboDebt kept churning along in the background, doing more and more damage. Some minor revisions were made, but these were very surface level, like updating how the letters looked and improving the online platform, but the fundamental issues remained. A few years later, in 2019, the Greens referred RoboDebt for a second Senate inquiry that ultimately generated six reports. This time, it made even stronger recommendations, including the second report that recommended RoboDebt be terminated immediately, and the final report that recommended a Royal Commission be established. And again, at the end of each report, the coalition senators did not accept the findings. Like before, they had their own coalition senators dissenting reports which tried to cover up for the government. They had all kinds of complaints in there, like the fact they didn't like people using the word RoboDebt. But the most ludicrous part was this, in the final report. RoboDebt has been subject to extensive scrutiny. This is apparently through the Commonwealth Ombudsman, who we know didn't properly consider the issues, Senate inquiries, which recommended the program be shut down but was ignored by the government, and federal court decisions, by this, I'm assuming they mean the court cases that brought on the collapse of RoboDebt, which was a massive embarrassment for the coalition that had been saying there was nothing wrong all along. But the RoboDebt program has not been subject to extensive scrutiny as the coalition pretends. Key questions remain unanswered, like when did the government know it was unlawful? The 2019 Senate inquiry tried to look into this, but the coalition refused to provide them with the relevant information claiming it would not be in the public interest. This question is one I'll be delving into deeper in the next episode, when I look into the coalition cover-up of all the warning signs and the ultimate collapse of the program. Until then, I want to leave you with former Prime Minister Scott Morrison. The government was adamant that they were not going to apologise for this program. But in 2020, many years after the program had been running and destroying people's lives, and well after it was exposed as unlawful, Scott Morrison apologised, kind of. And I would apologise to any, um, any hurt or harm in, in the way that the government has, has dealt with that issue and to anyone else who's find themselves in those situations. But the issue, Mr Speaker, is the one of showing how the government can best do this. That is the extent of the coalition's acknowledgement of the issues. 
After that apology, they continued to fight court cases, play down RoboDebt's impact, and continue to prosecute people caught up in that system. I don't buy that apology. It seemed fake to me, and after the next episode, you'll see why. Thanks for watching. If you want to help me make more content, please consider checking out my Patreon page, links in the description.